everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. I'm Coral Mulvaselli. I'm the founder of All in Tech. I'll be your host for the for the next hour. My co-host today, I'll be I'm shared with Vivian Zhang. She is also a founding member of uh, the team at, at All in Tech. Um, today, I'm very happy to present our uh, third webinar in this in the Upskill series. It's Biophilic Design and Mental Health, and we're shared by the wonderful and leading expert in biophilia, Natasha Jade, who's the founder of Natasha Jade Studio. Biophilia, or the love of all things that is living, speaks to our inherent ability to connect with the natural world. I'm really excited to see what Natasha has to say. Um, and with that said, I'm going to give her the floor. And by, before I do, just make sure that your microphones are on mute. Keep your video off if you can for bandwidth purposes. That would be really great. Um, and ask your questions to the chat function. We're going to try to make sure that we have time for Q&A after, but do ask your questions to the chat function um, if you can. So with that said, I'm going to give the floor over to Natasha. Really excited to have you today, Natasha. Thank you so much. So, um, yeah, as Carl mentioned, I run a um, consultancy and studio around biophilic design, working with a lot of interior designers and architects and companies in the UK and around the world. And it's really nice today to have a chat about biophilic design and mental health, because obviously that's something that is very prominent and a big issue at the moment, for, you know, especially after the last year. So what would be really great during this session is I like to have as much engagement as possible. So I'm going to pose a couple of questions that are quite good to get people thinking about. So you're welcome at that point if you want to, one or two brave people can unmike and um, engage with me in the session um, or definitely write your answers in the chat and then we can start to make sure that we're all on the same page and that I can really check that you guys are understanding and getting the concepts that I'm talking about. And of course, any questions, um, put them in the chat and Coral will definitely feed them back to me. Great. So before we start, what I'd like everyone to do is sit back in their chairs for a moment and close their eyes. Maybe take a deep breath, an inhalation and an exhalation. So what I normally do is breathe for five breaths. So we inhale for one, two, three, four, five, and exhale, two, three, four, five. Good. So what I'd like you to do in your mind is take yourself back to a time where you felt really calm, really focused, really relaxed, in a really good state of mind, really connected to the people around you, really clear, really feeling like you were the best version of yourself. And in your mind, have a look at the place around you, have a look at the colors, the textures, the land organization, the people, the buildings, really hold this place in your mind. Do a 360 in your mind. And then when you're ready, open your eyes again. And anyone is welcome, or maybe Vivian or Coral is welcome to share this place a little bit if they want to. Um, because it's great for when we're going through the session to keep this in mind as we kind of talk about the ideas of biophilic design. So I don't know if Vivian or Coral, you want to share your place, maybe? No, nope. maybe we've got something in the chat. Okay, well, anyway, as we go through the session, what would be great is for you um, really keep this place in your mind, and then we can, in, you, it, it's nice to see how the concepts of biophilic design relate back. Oh, Coral, you want to share? <laughs> yeah, the, the place I have in my mind is, um, just a very serene place, uh, surrounded by nature, surrounded by light. Um, and yeah, that, it's, a, it's a very uh, quiet and, and unique place. That's great. So what you're talking about has a lot of biophilic features in it and keep that in mind as we go through. So again, again, a question to pose to everyone. Mental health is a big issue at the moment. And I was wondering what you guys feel are the biggest issues around mental health at the moment. So I don't know if you want to put that in the chat um, or maybe Coral or Vivian wants to just feedback a, a bit of what they hear about 
um, issues around mental health at the moment. Yeah, um, I'll start and then Vivian, if you have anything that do. Um, a lot of the issues around mental health at the moment, I think has become exacerbated by the pandemic. People are working um, from home in small space, in small spaces. Sometimes, and I can speak to this, my bedroom is also my office and it's really hard to turn off mentally from my work and from my personal life. I think that's become very difficult. Yeah, definitely. Um, and actually, so I had a big chat with a lady who ran a big mental health charity here in the UK. And the biggest issues that they were facing was loneliness, lack of community, people having not having a sense of really belonging. So being really driven to social media a lot more. Um, a lot of, unfortunately, suicides were quite common among younger kids during the pandemic and really centered around this isolation from loneliness. And I see someone's just written the chat, not being able to physically connect, which is definitely a really big issue. So what we're really gonna do today is look at how biophilic design can really help bolster what we might be doing in our, in our personal worlds. Maybe it's around yoga or around meditation to really, to help our mental health bolstering it to help design our spaces in a way that support what we're doing in this internal world and looking at how we can design our spaces to bring the effects of a stressful environment really down. I hope that is good for everyone. Um, what I'm gonna do quickly is share my screen. Great, hold on. Um, great. So we're going to really talk about the links between nature design and mental health. I'm going to explain what biophilic design is, why biophilic design is so relevant to our health, well-being and productivity, why biophilic design allows us to bring elements of nature into our environment that have a really strong effect on the physical functioning of our body. Also, we're going to look at ways that of examples that institutions have changed the design of their spaces and that's really um, enhanced a better mental uh, situation for the people involved and also examples where people have brought and where we can bring nature into our environments and that really enhances the uh, mental, effect, mental health effects of the spaces as well. So let me, okay, so what is biophilic design just to be clear? Just as a butterfly is very much influenced by, well, let's say just as a caterpillar is very much influenced by the time it spends in its cocoon, how the butterfly experiences life in our world, the way that our ancestors experience life throughout evolutionary history influences now how we perceive safety, comfort and security in our modern built environment. Yeah, makes sense. So why is this important? Certain colors, certain textures, certain ways of relating to our environments, certain geographies, certain elements of nature were so important to how our species was able to survive and thrive that what happened was these elements of nature became biologically encoded into our DNA, okay? So when we bring these elements of nature into our environments, it has a profound effect on this innate tendency, okay? So we feel much more innately safe, secure and connected, which means, so essentially working on the, flight, the fight or flight, right? So a lot of energy that would be used in our digestive system, sorry, so that's this energy that would be used to innately feel us, make us feel innately safe and secure can be redirected to other parts of our body. For example, to our digestive systems, which is obviously important for our physiological well-being to our cognitive systems, which is obviously important for productivity, to our um, stress levels as well, which is obviously important for our happiness and overall attitudes and mood, okay? Does that make sense? A little nod or a little yes would be great. Yes. Okay, great. So let me just, um, okay, cool. So let's just recap about this. Biophilia, okay, is our inherent ability to affiliate with, oh, sorry, just went a bit fast. One sec, okay, cool. So biophilia is our inherent ability to affiliate with- Sorry, Natasha, we can't see your slides. Are you on your slides? You can't see my slides, hold on, okay. 
Let me hold on. Did you just see it before? No. Did anyone else? Okay. Can you see it? No, I didn't see neither. Okay. Sorry. No, 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 yes. Okay. Perfect. Excuse me a little. I haven't actually done a Zoom one in a while. So we're doing a lot of knives. So a slight technical hitch, but there we go. We're back. Can everyone see? Yeah. Yes. Okay, perfect. So biophilia is our inherent ability to affiliate with, with nature as we evolve, evolve throughout history. And biophilic design is designing our modern built environment with this connection in mind. Yeah, makes sense? Cool. Great. So again, maybe a question for Coral um, or for anyone that wants to answer. Have you guys had an experience or maybe you have an example of an experience where you've brought nature into an environment and it has made an effect on the people's health and well, mental health and well-being? Any examples that you might have read about in the news or maybe it's happened to yourself or you've brought certain elements of nature into your space and you've noticed quite a big difference. Um, I'll speak to that, Natasha. Um, just even like I've taken to just buying like really small bouquets of flowers when I go do a weekly shop and it just livens up the room that I'm working out of just so there's something for me uh, like something else that I can look at and something that is yeah that is alive and I think it makes a huge difference. Okay great that's great so there are amazing examples of where people have brought elements of nature into the um into the spaces I love this one study I hope everyone again if you don't see the slides just let me know. So Ellen Langer in the 70s did a study in America where they gave um, nursing home residents a plant to look after. And in the studies, they found that people who had to look after a plant, not, their, their life was actually extended more, more than the people who were, had a plant in their rooms, but was looking, looked after by the nursing home staff. And which is kind of what I mean, which is amazing. And also the, their anxiety and their state of um, mental well-being was a lot more increased than the people that actually just had a plant, but it was looked after by someone else. Um, so this is a study. Well, this is a table that's presented by Terrapin Green, who is a big biophilic design studio out in the US. And they've really codified how different elements of nature can have a physical effect on the functioning of our body and all the science that goes behind it. So we're gonna talk about a lot of these in the session, but so for example, Vivian, you spoke about flowers, okay? So that would be a visual connection to nature, which is very important for our stress reduction. A visual connection to, to nature lowers our blood pressure and our heart rate. Again, key for en enhancing a good mental health improves our mental engagement and attentiveness, which is important for our cognitive performance. Um, sorry, let me just put this here. Is um, impacts our attitude and mood, which is obviously great for our, our whole overall positivity and our, our emotions. Again, also a non-visual connection to nature, sounds, noises, textures. That's key for our blood pressure and our stress hormone, which is really obviously important for lowering our stress levels. Having this non-visual connection to nature impacts our cognitive performance, so we're able to concentrate better. It's important for our tranquility and our mental health, which is obviously important for our mood and our overall connection and our overall sense of positivity. There's also the non-rhythmic sensory stimuli as well, so again more natural sounds that can't necessarily be codified but can um, are, are sounds that are existent in the natural world and these impact our heart rate which is obviously good for stress levels this is important for our blood pressure and our sympathetic nervous system this is a um, behavioral mechanism that we feel a lot more connected to so again allows situations that really enhance our productivity and our cognitive thinking so it's amazing to really think about how these um, elements of nature in a visual and in a um, natural way can really start to change our environments from a design perspective. So the question I have, and maybe this is something to think about is, what is the impact when we get this wrong? Or when we don't get this right? So I have an example, actually a personal example. Oh. Yeah. I was um, a while ago about 
a year and a half ago, I had a studio in Whitechapel, England, in London, and it was in a very stressful situation for me personally. It was at the end of this alleyway and there was a lot of problems with drug dealing and with um, like addicts basically. Um, and it, it, was, it was very, very testing. The road was a mess. Um, there was lots of people there and my mental health at the time was not, it was safe to say probably not in the, in the best space. So I do a lot of studying about biophilic design and I read was reading at this time this article by Stephen Kellett, who is really the godfather of biophilic design. And he cited this study where there's two buildings in Chicago. One, so two buildings where people were living, residential blocks. One had a little bit of greenery and one didn't. And he calculated, or this study calculated that the crime reported in the building where there was no greenery was a 50% more increase than the one that there was a little bit of plants. So they were really thinking about how just a tiny little change in bringing the nature from the outside environment, sorry, from in the natural world into our living spaces had this profound effect on the stress levels and, and in the crime in the spaces around. So I did my own little tiny experiment, which was very low key, obviously, because we, I didn't want to start bringing loads of plants into the spaces. But what I did with the landlord was thought, OK, we want to bring the stress levels down. Let's just bring some plants into the spaces where it's like really, really bad, where all the addicts and the dealers sit. And let's see what happens. When I was setting the plants up, um, the people in the residential block around me were like, no way, you know, the, the plants are going to be stolen. What are you doing? They're going to be graffitied on. This is ridiculous. But to everyone's surprise, for the six months that I remained, that road stayed absolutely clear no one touched the plants people really respected the area it was a lot people could feel that just by adding four plants in a very low key i mean this was a budget experiment really um changed the feel of this tiny tiny little space which is kind of amazing and um there was an article written in the sunday times about nature design and mental health and they really went into how did people use different elements of nature to lower our, um, or to, to help uh, poor mental health situations. And they cited this experiment, which was pretty nice to have it <laughs> recognized in this kind of small way. So that's a little bit of, you know, a little low key way of, of an example of how these things have actually had a really personal effect on my life. Um, so again, a lot of, I, when I research into mental health, a lot of poor mental health is in a, around prisons, and that's a great place to start from. And there's this incredible paper where the person Moore, who wrote the paper, showed that inmates with external views of nature had reduced blood pressure and used institutional healthcare facilities less when compared to inmates who only had views of courtyards. So again, a really big. Uh, example of how these elements of nature are really affecting people's health and well-being. Okay, so again, a question to pose. Has anyone had an experience of where a redesign of a setting in whatever manner has had a profound effect of the lives of the people involved, of the mental health of the people involved? I don't know if Coral, you've had an example or you know about an example where uh, where, where a redesign has happened and people's mental health and well-being has been much better since. Yeah, there's um, Megan in the chat actually posed a comment. She's talking about a study about seeing nature about there. Wasn't there a study about seeing nature out of hospital windows made the patients get better faster? Um, We're doing that in a minute. I'm going to get there. Um, but in, in terms of like examples, I know for myself, like whenever um, I'm, I'm in a space, a co-working space that has more plants, more light, more space, um, I, I feel like I'm more productive. I'm just happier. Whenever I've been in a co-working space that doesn't have a lot of colors, not a lot of plants, even fake plants compared to real plants, that has an impact. Yeah, great. So this is all biophilic stuff and we're going to we're gonna get there in a minute. That, that, I'm so glad you say that. So I just wanted to bring a couple of examples because it's nice to see on the large scale how institutions have redesigned 
the environment and the mental health of the people involved has been much better. So this is an example of, um, uh, well, actually it's just, it's Osmarka uh, psychiatric ward in Norway. And in the seventies, they did this experiment where they split the patients into two wards. One was a very sterile kind of classic white walled ward and the other they um, designed it in a style that's called normalization which means in a homely style to make it like a Norwegian home. Unfortunately I don't have photos of this because it was a private study and in the 70s but what they calculated or the results of the study was that when it was the normalization wing so the homely wing people were a lot less depressed the anxiety was a lot um, was much more uh, what was much lower and what was amazing was that for the next two years there was no case of vandalization in the ward that was normalized so again this familiar familiarity and this sense of homeliness is something that has been really key in enhancing people's mental health another example back in the you guys might know about this in the 70s, there was a crazy amount of crimes in America and prisons were in quite a bad state. And there was this an experiment. These two police officers, um, Baker and Miller, realized that if they changed, so they added the, these two pigments of white and red into this certain type of pink. And what happened was when they painted all the prison walls this certain type of pink, there was literally no cases of crime reported in, in the time that it was painted pink, which was like absolutely groundbreaking at the time. And um, it really caught on and they started to um, paint sports facilities and um, locker rooms in, in the color pink because it was meant to really calm people down. So a nice example. Again, someone just mentioned the study by Roger Ulrich, and we're gonna get onto this in a moment. Roger Ulrich is very well known in the biophilic design community. He conducted a study where patients who were recovering from gallbladder, therapy, from gallbladder surgery were split into three groups, okay? One group had to look at a brick wall, one had to look at a car park, and one had to look at a views to nature. And what happened was, the patients that were looking at a view, the view to nature recovered um, on average half a day faster than the patients who were just looking at a brick wall or a car park. The amount of um, prescription drugs was decreased. The morale was in completely increased between them and the care workers. And Terrapin Green, who I just mentioned, who created the table, calculated in a study called the economics of biophilic design that if America was to implement maybe one or two elements of biophilic design such as a view to nature the healing rates could be even if the healing rates allow patients to heal up to half a day earlier that the healthcare um, facilities in the U.S. could save on average 93 million per year so that is amazing to see how this can really affect the overall infrastructure of society. Um, again, from the study of prison services and architecture and design, they showed that nature scenes have also helped patients dealing with pain, aided in recovery from health issues and reduced blood pressure and heart rate. Amazing examples and very relevant to where we're living, where we, which is quite high stressful and especially with what's been going on with COVID, where we need to start really seeing how we can bring elements of nature into our spaces to cultivate really good mental health and well-being. So, oh, I, oh, I flipped too fast, but I have another question for you guys. Maybe Coral, and I'm sorry if you don't know about this example because you don't live in England, but maybe Coral, you want to answer this question. I am, I am inviting you out for coffee. You are in Shoreditch Station, and we can go to the city to meet, or we can go to Columbia Road on a Sunday. Where do you want to go? Columbia Road is where again in London? It's um, in, it's near Shoreditch. You know, yeah. now market with all the say Columbia Road. Um, I I would want to go to Shoreditch because <laughs> there's more life in Shoreditch. <laughs> Great. So the example, the right answer is Columbia Road. Columbia Road is very much, um, it looks very classic London, whereas the city 
you could pick up the buildings and you could be in New York or you could be in Tel Aviv or you could be in Tokyo. And the point of this example is that throughout evolutionary history, okay, when we had an understanding of the people around us and the places around us, we fared a lot better. So being territorial became an evolutionary advantage, okay? So even now, when we have a sense of community and a sense of place and belonging, we, it connects to this innate tendency and we feel a lot safer, secure and connected, yeah? Which is obviously important for, as I explained before, for our overall health and well-being. So a sense of community. And again, when I was speaking to the people from the mental health charity, it really highlighted to me how many times they said that the biggest issue around mental health was this lack of community and this lack of connection to place and to each other that people are experiencing at the moment. Okay, so the question is, how can we start to bring these elements of nature into our spaces on a very practical level in a biophilic way? I want everyone to, again, sit back in their chairs and close their eyes. And what I want you to do is imagine you're sitting in your spaces right now and you have behind you a whole load of hanging, hanging vine leaves, but they're dying, okay? Unfortunately, they're dying. And then, the, and then you have a window in front of you and you can see a big green wall but unfortunately you can't touch it because it's all barred off and, you can't, in, and you, you can't engage with it. And then you have some cactuses on a um, little windowsill, but again, the window's shut and you can't access them. And I have a whole load of palm trees that I've flown in from Thailand that are in your house as well. And I have, you have one little, green plant in the corner that's dying. So maybe Carl or Vivian or anyone else that wants to tell me, just how, do you, how does this make you feel? Anyone? I would feel a little bit frustrated if I can't touch something. I would want to touch it. Yeah, exactly, great. So from a biophilic perspective, what's really important. If we're bringing nature and plants into our environment, one, we have to be able to touch it. It has to be accessible. It has to be um, alive. Biophilia, love of all that's living. It has to be something that we um, can, can have that engagement with. Um, again, community. If we start to bring plants from Thailand or from, um, a country that isn't local to our environment, that's not going to do much for affirming life and affirming the sense of community. So local is really important. It has to be, as mentioned, well-maintained. It has to be um, connected to the other elements of the design. This is a great example because it shows how we were able to really, well, how this um, example really weaved the different elements of nature into a space. Again, a biophilic principle is really that when we were in the natural world, we fared a lot better when we understood how different elements connected to the overall whole. So we want things to be experienced as a whole as opposed to the individual parts. And again, here we can see how the colors of the trees reflect the colors of the buildings and it's weaving into a sense of cohesion. That's really important. Um, Singapore is becoming quite a name for biophilic design and in some respects it's really leading especially what it's doing with plants and what it's doing with nature but again what's really important is that everything is local because the sense of community and the sense of connecting to place and the sense of belonging is key. Um, a nice example of a school in England that started to use different elements of nature to connect um, on the outside of the wall. And it was an experiment in how a sense of community and a sense of joining and collaboration can enhance the well-being of the people in the school. So that's just a couple of examples. Um, trees. So again, looking at mental health and nature, there's certain trees that we're more connected to. And um, this is so for, from a health and well-being perspective. We, this study uh, argues that we're more drawn to trees that have small, smaller trunks and much larger um, leaves. 
I know that resonates for me. Hopefully it will resonate for you. Um, in this study about nature and mental health as well, they calculated that, that, so in this particular study, each additional tree planted per kilometer of street was associated with 1.38 fewer antidepressants, um, which is amazing and very, very important if we're looking at nature and mental health. Okay, so again, there's certain uh, environments and certain uh, ways of organizing our surroundings that are important from a biophilic perspective. The first is edges of forests. I don't know if anyone wants to have a guess why an edge of a forest is so important from a biophilic perspective. Maybe Vivian or maybe someone in the chat. Or, or maybe just think in your mind, have, have a think. Okay, and then I'll tell you. So when we were up until 2000 years ago, really we spent most of our life in the natural environment. And the way that we were, when we were, felt we, humans gravitated towards edges of forest because we could see a long distance our prey, but we were protected from predators at the edges of the forest. So we really connected to this sort of environment. A study by Judith Herwagen, who talks about nature, productivity and well-being and design, says that building environments that contain the essential features that pref or preferred natural settings will be more supportive of human well-being and performance than environments lacking these features. So edges of forests, another um, environment of significance is a savanna. Again, if anyone wants to guess why we have this special connection to savannas, you're more than welcome. I'm just gonna check in the chat. So Sophie has mentioned savanna is our natural state. Um, yes, but specifically human beings, why we have this innate connection is human beings start, started to stand upright in the savanna. So we still have this innate connection to what's called a savanna analog, grasslands with small dotters of trees. An analog is some or an environment that represents a savanna. And we're very much drawn to these as species. I don't know if anyone wants to guess what a savanna analog might be. And think in your mind. Sophie, do you have an idea? Uh, you, you have you posted some good comments there. Oh, I can't really comment. So Coral, maybe just read them to me. Oh, I was just calling on Sophie. She's she's posted some really good comments in the chat. If you want to unmute yourself and say anything, please do, Sophie. No pressure. Okay. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Yeah, it was me. I was just saying, talking about Savannah and um and our kind of natural state as hunter gatherers, um, and that it's partly to do with um the balance between prospect and refuge that there are places where you can take shelter but also places that you can see ahead for long periods of t for long um for long distances um and also it, it's there's um enough complexity in terms of variety of environment yes great so that's very very all very important savannah analogs places that we connect to now you know, we parks are very much a savanna analog. And um, if anyone's familiar with Hampstead Heath in London and or the marshes, we we draw, we are drawn to these kind of places. Um, and in this study about plants and mental health, they the University of Exeter found that people living near green spaces suffered less mental distress even after adjusting for income, education, and employment. So again, if we're thinking about how we want to start to um, enhance our own mental well-being and, men, and, and, and health, looking to go to walk in places that have a savanna type analog, spending more times in parks, spending more times at edges of forests, um, repeating our interaction with these places so that it becomes more of our, our life. And I will say that also as biophilia is more an innate tendency, this is something that requires a lot of social support and a lot of learning. So understanding why these places are of significance will really help us reap the benefits as well. Um, images, 
we might we might not be able to always connect with the natural world, but an image of nature has been shown to really bring down the effects of poor mental health. Um, in the study about architecture design for prison services, they cited that even experiences of nature, even via photographs and films, have been found to improve cognitive performance and attention capacity and to reduce anxiety and stress as well. Again, just a couple of examples of using images through the natural world. Sorry, of the natural world. This is Designers Guild. Fractals as well have a very big impact on our mental health and well-being. Fractal is where an image, a smaller part of the image is represented in the overall whole. So you can, for example, here we can zoom in and it will look the same small scale as it will large. These are all mathematical geometries found in the natural world. In a specific study in the economics of biophilic of biophilia, Terrapin Green showed that when subjects were shown images of fractal patterns in nature or townscapes of the built environment, essentially results reflecting the parasympathetic systems reactions showed that subjects were more wakefully relaxed when exposed to natural landscapes. The study concluded that in environments with many stimuli and patterns, the, sorry, the patterns that most likely to hold our attention and, and induce a relaxed response are pa fractal patterns commonly found in nature. So again, thinking how can we bring fractal patterns into our environments through wallpapers, through um, screensavers, through different designs that we might have in our, on our tablecloths and things like that. In fact, just have a look around. You can have a look and see if you've got any type of fractal um, designs in your spaces, or maybe think about where you might wanna bring some of these things into your spaces already. Okay, great. So light. Human beings have a very strong connection to light. That's very clear, but the question is why? I don't know if, just think about this for a moment. Why do we have this strong connection to light? So throughout evolutionary history, the way we were able to orient ourselves in the day was by understanding how the light moved throughout the sky. So even now, when we have this sense of time moving, of the change of time, we it connects to this innate tendency. We feel a lot more safe and secure and connected. And from the studies of Terrapin Green, we can see why does it reduce our stress? Because it impacts our circadian system functioning, which is key for our sense of vitality, for our sense of life, for a sense of connection to creation and orientating ourselves in where we are. So this is an amazing example by Gaudi, which is um, in the Sagrada Familia in Barcelona. You walk into this building and you know exactly what time of day it is, just by how the sun is reflecting onto the colored glass and off into the buildings. So that's incredible because it attracts hundreds and thousands of people per year. And even a hundred years after he's dying, we're still very much connected to this building. And actually when we think of a place at the beginning with our eyes closed, this is for me where I felt the most alive and connected. Is, is in this place. And obviously this is very intuitive and there wasn't a framework of biophilic design when Gaudi was creating this, but this sense of being able to orient ourselves and understand how time moves without any other external means is very, very key. Um, how can we do this? So we can use light patterns. We can use anything that allows us to show the passage of time through light. Um, this was a study in Massachusetts where they, the whole, the refurbishment was just around light basically. And the experiment was to see how people fared in terms of their productivity and well-being before and after. And um, absenteeism was reduced by 18%, I think it was. And morale was like increased, they calculated by an overall average of 20%. What they did was use a lot of these mobiles which allowed the light to come in, reflect on the mobiles and off into the windows. Sorry, off the windows into onto the building. So there was always a sense of time moving. We can do this by looking at natural light, by looking at light pools, by looking at colored glass, by looking at mirrors, by dynamic light, 
anything that allows us to have the sense of change. In fact, you can have a look now just around your space and imagine what it would be like maybe with a mirror reflect, reflecting light into the space or fractured um, or maybe broken mirrors or different colored glass or different mobiles. Just imagine what it would be like if you had that in your space now. I'm imagining and I would like it. <laughs> cool. So again, presence of water. Water reduces our stress levels, increases our feelings of tranquility, lowers our heart rate and blood pressure, which is important for our stress. Water improves our concentration and memory, which is key for our cognitive performance, enhances our psychological responsiveness, again, key for productivity and um, focus. Water is an observed preference and something that we're positively drawn to, which is important for our mood and our preference. There's certain elements of water, again, as human beings that we're more connected to from an evolutionary perspective. Anyone want to guess which those are? You're welcome to have a guess if you want to unmic yourself. Otherwise, I will tell you. So human beings, we're drawn to water that comes from a flowing river or a clear pond because essentially that's how we were able to collect water and we were able to drink so that's really key if we're bringing water into our environments it has to have a sense of cleanliness and often we like these patterns of light on water it's because the cleaner the water is the more the light reflects off off the water so clear ponds if we want to bring images of water into our environments clear ponds are really important flowing rivers Falling water in America is a good example of a building that attracts a lot of attention. Again, the sense of life, the sense of sustenance, the sense of vitality that has allowed us to survive, which is um, still very, very key in allowing us to feel safe in our environments now. Connection to natural systems. I just wanna check and see if there's anything on the chat. Okay. So if there's any questions, again, Coral, you're more than welcome to just button and bring the questions in. Um, so connections to natural systems. Throughout life, things change in terms of how we connect to a sense of change and a sense of movement. This, when we have this sense of uh, connection to death and decay and growth and effervescence, it connects to the sense of um, this deep sense of change and allows us to feel a lot more safer and is important for our mood and our preference. So this is a very interesting example of a garden that was from the Royal Horticultural Society in the Chelsea Flower Show in England. And what they did was they put it in um, a mental health facility in Highgate. And what was interesting was that the residents involved apparently the way that they connected to this garden was seeing how it moved and how it changed and that allowed them to see that they were possible that it was possible to change within themselves and that was the real difference that people noticed around them that they really connected to it in that way so the sense of change we the way we're able to orient ourselves in the year is by understanding how the sun moved throughout the sky so again sorry that the seasons change throughout the year so anything that reminds us of a sense of change, of a sense of movement is going to be key to connecting to this sense of natural systems. Even if it's as simple as you mentioned flowers before Vivian, in autumn, bringing a collection of autumn leaves onto our desks, just so that we have this understanding of where we are in the year. Color, color is really important from biophilic perspective. Again, just have a think to yourself, why is color so important? So in the natural world, edible plant fruit came with bright flowering plants. So now we're, um, it really allowed us to, to really tune into our eyesight and have a very strong sense of sight as we're diurnal creatures. So color is incredibly key, the sun, um, the sea, the clear water, the earth, flowers, as I just mentioned before, 
Uh, we have Sue here who says color indicates what is safe and what is dangerous. Exactly. And specifically because a lot of food came with bright flowering plants. So that's um, key. And I love this example of the Dome of Music in Barcelona, where it's very biophilic in the sense of the colors that are being used, the sunset and the earth. And you feel, for me, this is incredibly draws me in. So a material connection to nature. Again, how can we use our natural environment to enhance the mental health and well-being of the spaces around us? A material connection to nature decreases our blood pressure, which is important for our cognitive performance. A material connection to nature improves our creative performance. And it's, as it improves our comfort, it enhances our emotions and our mood. Okay, so examples are sand or bark or material cloth or um, uh, cork. These are all material connections to nature. Hemp is a good one. I mean, maybe, you know, we can sit on sheepskins or have um, material cloths. Uh, sometimes, you know, it's nice to have to eat on material placemats, things like that. Just little ways we can start to bring this connection into our everyday environment. So bio, another example, I'm just going to actually, no, oh no, we'll keep it here. Biomorphic design and biomimicry are, are also great ways to bring nature into our environments. Um, anyone have any ideas what biomimicry is? So biomimicry is when we take the function of a natural object and, you, and, and, and co copy it for its function. So for example, people who use spider webs to copy it for its strength or people who use like long streamlined animals and copy that for its function. That's biomimicry. Biomorphic design is when we create something and accidentally it looks like a natural form. So Stephen Kellett, who's obviously one of the leaders or was the leader in biophilic design until he died in 2019, says that biomorphic design has been linked to the inherent human affinity for natural forms that when successfully expressed, can enhance human psychological and mental well-being. So biomorphic form. Oh, here we go. And biomorphic form is observed view preference. And Lucy on the chat mentioned that that uh, was something that follows the pattern of nature. Good yeah. on you, Lucy. Yes, exactly. And the Sydney Opera House is a great example of that because it has um, its biomorphic and its biomimicry. It will it accidentally was it wasn't intended to look like what I think is a butterfly or a bird but it was based apparently on the structure of an orange peel which was to help it support so it, it has both and um, as human beings we're very drawn to this building so what I would like everyone to do we just this is an example of um in Singapore of a lot of where it's now considered um, a leader in biophilic design. And in some respects, it's in, especially what it's doing around plants is completely revolutionary. Um, what I would like everyone to do actually now is to sit back in their chairs again, maybe close their eyes, maybe take a deep inhalation and an exhalation, maybe inhale for one, two, three, four, five, and exhale, two, three, four, five. Good, so what I'd like you to do, bearing in mind of what I've just shown you with those specific examples, take yourself back to the place that we spoke about at the beginning. Maybe do a look around. Again, have a look at the colors and the light and the texture. And then when you're ready, you're more than welcome to open your eyes. And I don't know if anyone want, want, wants to share how they felt the interaction was with this place before and or the first time and the second time. The first time I found it to be a bit more static. This time I added, there was, there was water, there was light glistening on the water. There was more texture on the foliage from the trees. 
um, there was a lot more involved. Okay, that's great. I don't know if anyone else wants another example or wants to give another example. Let's see if we've got something in the chat here. Okay, cool. So what I'd like everyone to do now is think about what I've just shown you and maybe think about three things that you might be able to do in your life that would definitely enhance the mental, the mental health of either your life or the people involved. Maybe it's looking at the way that you want to bring light into the space or looking at how you want to bring more local plants or connecting with certain elements of water. Just have a little think about it. And then if you want to write it into the chat or again on mic, you're more than welcome. And Coral, you can think about this as well. And Vivian. Yeah, actually, we're moving into a new office soon. I think what I'm going to think about and what I'm going to suggest is how we can incorporate more plants, um, maybe even a water a structure, anything where we can, it could even be a painting of water, but let's bring some of those elements in as much as we can in our new space. Great, Vivian. Yeah, um, actually our offices just re were just renovated right before the pandemic hit, but one of the big things that they did during the renovations is actually bring in a lot more plants. So there's like, um, each floor where the coffee and break rooms used to be or actually have now all been like added um, like a hanging plant wall and um, the few times that I've been in since um, it looks amazing and I think it just really brightens and livens the entire place up a lot more. Yeah definitely that's definitely amazing and I've noticed in the chat a couple of people are lo loving the idea of bring mirrors or glass that fractures light and someone else is saying that in the home office space is too dark and bring mirrors in. Yeah, different zones and variety of spaces. Unfortunately, we can't go through the whole biophilic. This is more of an introduction to biophilic design and certain elements around mental health. There is a whole framework, which is what I teach to design teams, which goes into the much more nuanced um, ways we can organize our environments to really bring the biophilic appeal of a space. Um, which includes different zones and organizing the complex and all the things that Sophie mentioned before. What I would say about the light is um, I worked for a long time as an artist and people always said to me, they loved the paintings where there was all the light with all the mirrors and it was life affirming. And I, for a long time, I could never understand why. After learning about and teaching a lot of biophilic design, I realized that it was, it, it was the painting, but it was more the fact that every day while the people were in the rooms with the paintings, the light was coming in through the windows, it was reflecting off the colored glass and it was making different patterns on the walls all day. And that was what was the life affirming, the sense of change and the sense of time and being oriented in the sense of movement, which connected people so much more to the design, to the artwork. So that's really good. Um, I don't know if anyone else wants to talk about a couple of things they might want to do or any other questions actually that you might have for me now as before we wrap up i don't know if there's any questions there were some questions um and i thought i'd leave uh for now for the q a around some of the research um that you shared and if you can share the names of any of the researchers, we can do this. Uh, we can we can circulate this um, after the fact. Um, if that's that might be easier through our uh, social media channels. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's lots. I mean, this is a very very tip of the iceberg of what's out there. But I can send um, Coral a lot more information so that you can have a whole host of things to look into, different research, different books. I think all the tables that I've had in the session as well. Yeah, definitely. Lucy asks, do you suggest any books for further learning for beginners? Yes, a whole load of books. And I will send that all to Coral and she will hopefully send it out to you. Is, is that good? I mean, yeah. my nature design and mental, uh, sorry, nature, nature by design, which is Stephen Kellett's book in 2019, that has changed my life. There's also the biophilia effect, which is amazing. Um, but all of Stephen Kellett's books are incredible. And um, I've read them all about a hundred times. 
if if everyone on the chat uh, subscribes to our newsletter and our social media, um, Instagram, Twitter being the most ones, uh, and LinkedIn, will everything will be circulated, but especially on our newsletter. Um, Vestina um, asks, what plants would you consider the most biophilic? I would say local plants, plants local to your environment, plants that are co connected to the rest of the space, um, plants that you look after well, plants that are not fake, that are real, and um, plants that are, not, a, a lot of it is actually about how we design the plants, necessarily what types of plants they are, but essentially local and as sustainable as possible, really. Yeah, that's what I would say. And the recording will be made available. If you subscribe to our newsletter, uh, we're going to circulate that over, um, over that platform. Um, so it will, it will be made available. I do have a question for you, Natasha. You mentioned that this is just an introduction that you work with companies, uh, the design teams in companies um, for a fuller description on biophilia. Um, how can people get in touch with you um, in order to talk, talk to you about that if they're interested? In my email in the chat now. Yeah, hold on. I can, I can, I can circulate that in the chat. Yes. No worries. So they can email you um, and you go through design teams. Leah says, thank you so much, Natasha. I just started teaching high school in New York City. Uh, the space is busy, rushed and tight space without any plants and very limited natural light. I'm going to have to devise a sustainable plan to in light, I would say enliven the space. Your talk is wonderful start. Whatever we do in the school needs to be a lasting change. So I'm thinking about the long term. I will be in touch with you to discuss follow up. Huge thanks. Uh, that's wonderful, Lee. Um, before we before we wrap up, um, there's just a few things we want to also just capture. Natasha, if you stop sharing your screen, I can I can share mine and and go through that. Thank you so much. Um, so. Uh, you know, uh, thank you guys so much. We, as All in Tech, we are a social enterprise. Uh, we would love to capture any feedback. If you guys really love this session or, or, or even if, you know, there's some words of consideration, can you please just tell us what you think? This is going to take three seconds, literally. Uh, join us at slido.com. Uh, put in the code 383105 so that we can, um, we can capture a little bit of feedback. I'm just going to take one minute so that we can all get a chance to do that before you leave the room, please. Uh, and I'm gonna put the codes. Uh, perfect, thanks Vivian. Um, and while you're doing that, just in the background, we do have an upcoming uh, upskill webinar in our upskill webinar series. Um, we do have an upcoming webinar. Um, it, we just released it last night. It's gonna be on Tuesday, November 23rd. It's gonna be a lunchtime hour as it is now. So that's a London time, lunchtime hour. We're gonna be chatting about how do you make your side, hus uh, your side hustle, your main hustle. And we'll be chatting with Selena Golbach. She's the founder of Alkalitech. She essentially started as a software engineer and she turned her side hustle of helping women uh, build their nutritional plans and, and losing weights and, and their well being into a full time hustle. And she works in London right now with a team. So she has some key insights on how do you turn, uh, you know, some of your side hustles into an entrepreneurial um, in, into an entrepreneurial uh, platform. Um, and before we go and before we wrap up, I just want to say thank you so much, Natasha. That was a very enlightening and informative conversation about biophilia. I, I think it helped demystify what biophilia means and helps us understand how we can incorporate some of that into our lives, into our workspaces and our personal spaces so that we can become, our well-being can be enhanced. So thank you so much. We're really, really grateful to have you and for you to spare this time to give us that introduction. Thank you. Okay, cool. Thanks, Carl. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, thank you guys so much. Like, really appreciate it. And Vivian, do you have any other words to add? I don't know if I missed anything in the chat. Well, no, I, I think you got all it, got all of it. Um, just make sure you follow the social media. If you haven't signed up for the newsletter, make sure you do that so that you will be notified once the recording of the session is available. Amazing. I will just say one thing that this really is the tip of an iceberg. There's so much 
to say that you can't really get across in one hour. And I hope that everyone realized that you realize that it's a very, very tip. <laughs> There's a lot more out there. <laughs> Absolutely. We can definitely see that. Everyone's saying thank you so much, that it was a it was a fantastic talk. It was inspirational, brilliant insight, great program. Gabriella says thank you. Sue says thank you. Sophie says thank you, Natasha. Um, a lot of thanks along the way, Natasha. So thank you guys so much. Thank you everyone for joining us on your lunch hour. Grateful that you gave us the time. Uh, hope to see you next time. Thank you guys. See you later. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.